It really is great to be with you and to come together and to worship God, to spend time in, in his house and in his presence. Uh, you might be wondering what Destiny Church is about. If this is your first time here, that's what I would be wondering if this is the first time that I had been to a church. We're about one thing, and it's one word, and it is Jesus. We are all about Jesus. We believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. We believe that he came from heaven to earth to save humanity, that humanity is lost and needs to be found. And the only way that we can be found and have a right relationship with the Father is through his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. He lived a life without sin. He died on the cross to save sinners. He rose again on the third day. He's returning again one day to establish his kingdom forever and ever and ever And all who are a part of his family, who have put their faith in him, will live forever in that kingdom. A kingdom where there's no darkness, no sorrow, no pain, no sickness, no disease, no death. Because Jesus on the cross defeated even death. That's what we're about at Destiny Church. We're about the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that is pretty much it. So we sing to Jesus We worship Jesus. We love Jesus. He's in our hearts. He's in our lives. We live for Jesus. It's not about us. It's all about him. And so when we come together, again, we sing, we worship, and we turn to his word to hear what he has to say. It's really not that important what I have to say. If you go sit down with me and we get lunch or coffee or something, I don't have that much that's important to say. I can talk to you about the weather. I can talk to you about the Spurs. I can talk to you about the Cowboys, but there's not much to talk about there. I can talk to you about face masks and viruses and stats, but who cares what I have to say? Because God has spoken to us in his word. And so when we come together, we don't come together to hear what I have to say, or what anybody else has to say. We come together to hear what God has said. And so every time we come together, we're going to worship and we're going to open the word. It's simple, but this is what God has called his church to be about and his church to do. And so if you have your Bibles tonight, and I hope that you do, but if you have your Bibles, you can open them to Matthew chapter 14. Matthew chapter 14 is a passage that we're going to look at tonight and if you don't have a Bible, there's an app on your phone. You can get a, 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 an app Bible, um, which is kind of like a Bible, but it's on your phone and you can download it. Uh, but if you have a Bible, um, bring your Bible next time to church. Uh, we should bring our Bibles to church. Amen. Amen. All right. Great. <laughs> so I'm going to pray. We're going to jump right into Matthew 14 tonight. Father, we thank you for your word. Lord, your word, which is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Lord, though the world is in darkness, we don't have to stumble around because you have revealed yourself to us. Lord, you are the author and the giver of life. You are the creator of all things. Lord, though humanity has strayed from you, you came in the person of your son, Jesus, to rescue us. Lord, as we spend time in your word tonight, I pray that our love for you would grow evermore. Lord, as we sung tonight about our hearts burning, Lord, that our hearts would be so on fire, so passionate for you because Lord, you have, have laid down your life to save us and to rescue us. Lord, I pray that you would speak to our hearts through your word and that the name of Christ would be glorified in this place and in our lives. It's in the name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. Matthew chapter 14 And I'm going to start in verse 22. And it says, immediately he, that's Jesus, he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side. That's the other side of the lake where they were at. So he puts his disciples in a boat boat, and he sends them on ahead of him. And it says, while he was there dismissing the crowds, this was after a great miracle that Jesus had done. Jesus dismisses the crowds and he sends his disciples on ahead of him. 
And it says, after he dismissed the crowds, Jesus went up on the mountain by himself to pray. And when evening came, he was there all alone. But the boat, by this time, the boat with the disciples, was a long way from the land. And it was being beaten by the waves, for the wind was against them. And in the fourth watch of the night, that's between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m., he came to them walking on the sea. But when the disciples saw him walking on the sea, they were terrified and said, It is a ghost. And they cried out in fear. But immediately Jesus spoke to them saying, Take heart, it is I, do not be afraid. And Peter answered him, that's one of Jesus' disciples. He said, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you on the water. And Jesus said, come. So Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But when he saw the wind, he was terrified and began to sink. And he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and took hold of him, saying to him, O you of little faith, why did you doubt? And when they got into the boat, the wind ceased. And those in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly you are the Son of God. As we read this passage, it, it really is, it speaks to us right now in, in what we're going through in life because the disciples, they set out on a journey. They, they have somewhere that they want to go. Jesus tells them to go to the other side. And, and this trip that they were making, it, it should not have taken them as long as it did. It, it should only have taken them maybe an hour to get across this lake. It's not a big lake. And it, they went and they were rowing all the way from dinner time when Jesus dismissed them to sometime between 3 a.m. and 6 a.m. when Jesus finally came out to them. And the reason it took them so long is because they were in the midst of a huge storm. And you might now feel like your life is in the middle of a storm. I know that for all of us, going through 2020 is a little bit like going through life in a rowboat in the middle of a storm. The things that are happening in our world today with the pandemic, with the economy, with the shutdowns, All of these things, these were not things that we planned for in 2020. How many of you set out with 2020 in mind thinking it would look a little bit different than it does today? But there are storms in life. And all of us face battles. All of us face challenges. All of us face storms in our lives. But what I want you to see in this passage is that when we're in the middle of the storm, Jesus comes to us. Jesus does not leave us in the midst of the storm to fend for ourselves and to figure things out on our own. No, in fact, Jesus came to his disciples to save them and to rescue them in the midst of the storm. And in the midst of the storm, Jesus comes to his disciples and and at first they don't recognize him. At first they think it's a ghost or, or, I mean, they were terrified. They didn't know what to think. They had never heard of anybody walking on the water before. They had been on this sea and this lake many times and never once had they seen somebody walking on the water. But here Jesus comes to them in the midst of the storm. And what I want you to see is that Jesus uses the storms of life to draw us closer to himself. Jesus uses the the storms of life to draw us closer to himself. The disciples are, are far from him. They're, they're, they're in the middle of, of this life-threatening situation. And Jesus goes out to them and he begins to draw them to himself. But I want you to know tonight, if, if you are in the midst of a storm, if you're in the midst of a battle, if you're in the midst of hardship or difficulty or confusing times, listen, you don't have to go through it alone. You don't have to go through the storms of life alone. We serve the God who has come to us in the person of Jesus Christ. And he uses the storms of life to draw us closer to himself. 
I believe that you are here tonight because God is drawing you closer to himself. God is drawing you into a, an, an even deeper relationship with him. Maybe you served him in the past. Maybe you uh, used to be a part of a church or, or maybe you grew up in the church or, or, or whatever it is. Maybe you've, you've always been in the church, but God wants to draw you into an even deeper and even closer relationship with himself. And Peter, he says, Lord, if it's you, let me come to you. And Jesus says, come. Of course, Peter begins to sink and he calls out to Jesus to save him. He calls out to Jesus to, to save him. And immediately Jesus does and they get back into the boat. And as soon as they get in the boat, the, the storm ceases. And it says that they worshipped him. They said, truly, you are the son of God. Because not only does Jesus use the storms of life to draw us closer to himself, he uses the storms of life to show us who he really is. To, to reveal himself to us in, a, in an even more powerful way than maybe we've seen him before. And we all go through storms in life. Maybe you're in a situation where you just think, how in the world did I get into this? How in the world will I ever get out of this? Maybe you've been trying this and you've been trying that. But in, in spite of your best efforts, you still find yourself sinking. Jesus, what he does for Peter, he will do the same for you because Jesus is the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. You see, Peter's not the only one who needed rescuing. We all need a savior. We, we all need rescuing. And, and Jesus was sent by God, the Father, to the world to rescue lost humanity. You see, this story is a, it is a picture of Jesus' rescue mission to save the world. Jesus himself said that he came to seek and to save the lost. Well, who are the lost? We are. Humanity is lost. Humanity is broken. Humanity is going their own way, searching, trying to find something that will bring them happiness and peace and joy. And it all it ends up ever bringing is brokenness and pain. Humanity is lost. Isaiah 53, 6 says, All of us like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. Romans chapter 3, verses 10 through 12 says, None is righteous, no, not one. No one understands. No one seeks for God. All have turned aside. Together they have become worthless. No one does good, not even one. You might say, well, I'm a, I'm a good person. I mean, I'm not, I'm not like this guy, what this is describing here. But listen, compared to God and his holiness and his righteous standard of perfection, all of us have fallen short. All of us have sinned and fallen short of his glory. We turned our own way. We've, we've followed our own heart. We've sinned against God. We've sinned against our neighbor. Because of sin, we are separated from God. We are dead in our trespasses and sin, spiritually dead. And this is the state that humanity finds itself in today, rebelling against God, broken, dead, and dying. This rebellion against God is sin. We've all broken his law. And God, who is holy and perfect and righteous, his holiness demands justice. His holiness demands that sin be paid for, that sin be atoned for. We serve a God of justice, of true justice. And this is a good thing. It's an expression of his nature and his character. It's a little bit scary to us because we are not just. And we are not holy and we are not righteous. But this is where the cross comes into place. Because at the cross of Jesus Christ, the justice of God is satisfied and the love of God is fully expressed. 
You see, the cross is where the justice of God and the love of God meet perfectly as Jesus bleeds and hangs and dies to pay the price for sin. God is not content to leave us in this broken state. 1 John 4, 9 and 10 says, This is the love of God. And it has been manifest among us that God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that God loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That means the atoning sacrifice. That is the love of God. Jesus Christ hanging on a tree, dying for sin. This is God's love manifest towards us. Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Before you ever thought about taking a step for God, God is pursuing you. God is coming after you. God has sent his son Jesus to seek and to save the lost, to call you back into a right relationship with the Father, to call you back to repentance of sin, and to call you to faith in Jesus Christ, where you will have your sins forgiven, where you will have your relationship with God restored, where you will be filled with the Spirit of God to live a life that he's called you to live, to be lights shining now in the dark world. Jesus didn't only die for our sins, which he did, but God raised him to life on the third day to prove that Jesus had conquered sin, to prove that Jesus had conquered death, to prove that Jesus had conquered Satan and hell and the grave. I've been to the land of Israel. I've seen the tomb where Jesus was laid. Let me tell you something. There's nobody there. The the tomb is empty because Jesus has risen from the dead. Jesus rose from the dead in victory, crushing the head of Satan, the enemy of your soul, so that all who would put their faith in him could live a life of freedom, could live a life of victory could live a life where the storms of life, though they may come, they will not drown you, they will not defeat you, and they will not take you out. Because Jesus Christ is victorious, everyone who is in Christ shares in his victorious resurrection. Amen. And this is why we call this the good news. This is why this is called the gospel because it is good news. There's nobody else like Jesus. He alone is the way to God. He alone stands as the mediator between God and man because he was both God and man. He alone is the way, the truth, and the life. He alone bore the sin of the world. He alone conquered death. He alone has defeated Satan. He alone has the power to heal and to deliver and to restore and to redeem. And his name is Jesus Christ. And he alone has the power to save. Amen. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 talks about the redemption that we have in Jesus Christ. And it says, if anyone be in Christ, that means if anyone has put their faith in Jesus, the Bible says that you are now a new creation. Your old life of sin, your old life of shame, your old life of brokenness, your own life of defeat and darkness is gone. If you are in Christ, you are a new creation. The life and the love of Jesus fills and floods your soul and transforms you from a son of darkness to a son of the light, from a daughter of the devil to a daughter of God. It is an identity replacement. We're no longer in Christ sinners, but we're declared to be saints. 
Though we may struggle and though we may fall, his power is made perfect in our weakness. His, he gives us his spirit to help us to live a new day every day. We are new creations. Romans 8 chapter 1 says that we know that there is now therefore no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. When we put our faith in Jesus, he pays the price for our sin completely, totally. That There's not another sacrifice that needs to be made. There's not another price that needs to be paid. There's nothing else that needs to be atoned for. Because Jesus on the cross declared, it is finished. He paid it all on the cross. And so I don't have to live a life of defeat. I don't have to live a life of shame. I don't have to live a life of brokenness. I don't have to live a life of sorrow. Though, though I'm sorry for the things that I've done, I am a new creation in Christ Jesus. And we're called to live now as a new creation. We're, we're called to live now a new kind of life. The Jesus life, the life that Jesus lived, we're called to live that. To love God and to love others. How do we receive this salvation? How do we receive the gift that Jesus purchased for us on the cross? It's so simple. All we need to do is call out to him to save us. The Bible says everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Just like Peter, while he was sinking, while he was drowning, he called out to Jesus, Jesus, save me. You may be here today and feel like you're drowning in sin. You're drowning in darkness. The world is beating you up and taking you down. What you need today is not to swim harder, but you need to cry out to Jesus Christ to save you. And he will do like he's done to everyone who's ever called out to him. He will reach down and he will save you. And he will pull you up out of the muck. He will pull you up out of the mud, out of the sin. He will pull you and he will deliver you from those things. He will set you free from the shackles of bondage. Just like he saved Peter, Jesus will save you. Confess your need for a savior to God. No, there's this, it's the story of Peter drowning. And when you're drowning, you you don't just say, uh, um, excuse me. Um, if it wouldn't be too much trouble, uh, lifeguard, uh, could you jump in and and save me? No. What do you do? Well, when your life is, is on the line, do you care what anybody thinks about you? Do you care what kind of a fool you look like when you call out for help? No. You say, I need help. Save me. Save me. And, and if you're here tonight and you're separated from Christ, if you haven't put your faith in Jesus, you are drowning in your sin. You are being pulled down by the world. And you need to call out to Jesus Christ. It's not about what anybody else thinks about you. It's not about the people that came with you. It's about you and Jesus Christ. It's about you and are you right with God? Have you had your sins forgiven? Sin must be atoned for. Sin must be paid for. If you do not accept the free gift of salvation, you will stand before God one day condemned in your sin and to pay the price for your sin. Why do that when Jesus has already suffered in your place? He's already died in your place. He's risen again to give you new life. Repent of your sin and believe the gospel. Believe in Jesus Christ. Receive him into your life. Don't let another moment, don't let let another day pass you by. We're not promised tomorrow. Life is so short. We're here today. We're gone tomorrow. Life is like a vapor. It is fleeting. It passes by so quickly. 
Do not miss this moment. Do not miss this opportunity to call out to Jesus for salvation. God is pursuing you. Jesus is reaching his hand out for you today. Jesus came from heaven to earth on a rescue mission. And despite our best efforts, we still need a savior. Jesus Christ is that savior. And God uses the storms of our lives to show us the truth. God uses the storms of our lives to draw us closer to himself. God uses the storms of our life to show us who Jesus really is. Maybe you came in here tonight not knowing what this was going to be all about, a new church. Yeah, sure, I'll go check it out. Maybe a friend invited you to come with them. But you're in the middle of a storm. You know that you're sinking. You know that you need a savior. Listen, tonight is your night to call out to Jesus Christ. Tonight is your night. God preordained this moment from the foundation of the world to save your soul. Tonight is your night. Would you bow your heads with me in prayer? Father, we thank you that you love us so much. Lord, that you were willing to send your only son, the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and full of truth. Father, we thank you that Jesus has shed his blood, has paid the price for sin, that there's not another work, there's not another sacrifice. We receive it By trusting in your son, it is a free gift of grace. Lord, if there was anything we had to do to earn it, we would certainly fail at that. But you give salvation away freely to all who would call upon your name. Lord, I know that right now you're touching hearts. Lord, that right now you're speaking You're drawing people. Holy Spirit, right now, do a work of salvation. Do a work of redemption. Draw all men and women to yourself. If you're here tonight and you say, I I want to receive Jesus Christ. I I want to put my faith in Jesus. Today's the day. Tonight's the night. I'm not going to let another moment pass me by. I want salvation. I want redemption. I want forgiveness of sins. I want to be a new creation. If that's you, without anybody looking around tonight, would you simply slip up your hand and say, "I, I want to pray to receive Jesus Christ. to slip up your hand and say that's me tonight I am turning from sin tonight I am trusting in Jesus Amen let us all pray this prayer of salvation together Heavenly Father thank you for loving me thank you for sending your son Jesus to die on the cross in my place for my sin. I repent of my sin. I ask you to cleanse me. Make me clean. Thank you for loving me. I am now your child. Father, fill me with your spirit and help me to follow Jesus all the days of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. If you prayed that prayer and you prayed that prayer in faith, I believe what the Bible says is true and that you have passed from death to life. 
that you are now a new creation. Your old life of sin has passed away and the new life that Jesus came to bring has come to you. Salvation has come to you today. So let's clap our hands in celebration of that great fact today. In Jesus' name.